This podcast is brought to you by TaxCalc because we know that bringing you the very best in tax, accounts and practice management software is only the start of the journey. Welcome to the TaxCalc podcast of the TaxCalc webinar, The Cash Accounting Conundrum, presented by Andy North and Sarah Dudley with special guest Sharon Cook. The original webinar was broadcast on the 14th of February 2024 and can be viewed at www.taxcalc.com forward slash events. Please be aware that deadlines, rates and other technical details referenced may have changed since this date. Good afternoon and welcome back to TaxCalc TV. I'm Andy North, CMO here at TaxCalc and I must say it's great to be back in the studio following our break over Christmas. Thank you for joining us uh, and I hope you're well, well rested and recovered uh, even if it did get a little bit busy over January. Um, we wanted to start the year with something of a blockbuster uh, and with uh, 1,500 or so registrations this morning. I don't think we've let you down. Um, we're going to be looking today at the cash accounting conundrum. Uh, the announcement uh, made in the autumn statement that cash accounting will no longer uh, just be an option for some smaller unincorporated businesses, but the default for most of them. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at what the announcement means, means uh, what the implications might be for your clients, uh, and what kind of conversations you're going to ne need to have with your customers in the coming months. Uh, and of course, we don't seem to be able to run a webinar without mentioning MTD, so we'll be taking a look at that and basis period reform as well. Um, and to do that, we are joined once again by the awesome Sharon Cook, uh, the head of tax for the wonderful 2020 innovation. Um, just in case anyone out there is not familiar with Sharon or with 2020, Sharon, can you give us a little background? Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Really excited to be here. So Andy, as you've said, yes, um, I'm Technical Director of Tax at 2020 Innovation. Um, I'm responsible for our webinar programme and a number of our other products. So we do about 150 webinars a year across a number of technical and practice management topics. Uh, we go out and about, we see accountants to do compliance services. So it's a, it's a fun life. We always love having Sharon in. Thank you so much for coming in. And you did dress in hearts, which is uh, it, it's Valentine's Day. Um, so uh, we do we're not we're lacking Dean. He's away this week. Uh, so the equally awesome Sarah Dudley is with us. Uh, Sarah's official title is the uh, compliance specialist, but she's responsible for our tax return production tools. Uh, she's on hand to answer any questions that you've got about uh, tax count products uh, that might come up. Uh, so thank you once again, both of you, for coming and joining us. Um, before we start, there is always a little housekeeping. Um, we love your questions. We love your comments. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can. Do keep them coming throughout. If anything occurs to you, just throw it in. Uh, you've got two options. Chat is seen by everyone. Uh, and there's a box which is questions or Q&A. That's only seen by us. So if you've got something that's particularly you don't want everyone else to see, you do use that. But we'll try and focus on the chat because we can get some good engagement between everyone on there as well. Uh, secondly, yes, we will be sending a copy of this out. So only the most fastidious of you need to uh, maintain notes uh, throughout. But uh, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. But you will get a copy. So let's get started. Um, I think we're going to start with a poll. Uh, so there is a bottom um, right hand side. There's a little polls uh, icon if you hit that. And Sarah, what's what are we doing with the poll? So we'd like to know what proportion of your unincorporated business clients are currently using the cash basis? Will that be none, very few, some or a lot? So wait for those results to come in. You're you're you were quite cynical, weren't you, Sharon? Yeah. You think it's very few. Yeah, I don't see it a great deal with the uh, accountants that I uh, that I visit. It's fair to say. I, my view is it's predominantly unrepresented businesses that perhaps are using the cash accounting at the moment. But really interested to see the results of the poll. Absolutely. So Dean had uh, was equally sceptical. Yeah, yeah, he said one or two. Very, very rare. But uh, that could change in the coming years by the look of it. Um, so how are we getting on? What, what are the results looking like, Sarah? Um, I'm just having a look. Scores on the doors. Yeah. Oh, the scores are coming through. So we've got... Oh, can, can everyone, if you could chat me, can you see the poll? 
Uh, yeah, so we're looking at, in fact, yeah, we've got a vast majority with none, um, significant number with some, um, and even a few with a lot. We haven't specified well, what a lot is. No. That would be, but a lot being... I guess it depends on your client base, doesn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't have thought we'd get 16% claiming a lot. Mm. So that's that is quite yeah, that is interesting. So, okay, and this We've is a some... fairly representative poll. We've got, you know, a lot of people taking that. So there's five, six hundred people uh, already taking that. So, okay, let's start. So um, I think we're probably better off. Let's look uh, at the start. Can we get a reminder? What, what, the, what is cash accounting? How does it work? Well, I might need to hand over to some of these pros on the call, but uh, I'll... I'll run through. Um, they will hold. They'll yeah, call so, you out if you get it wrong. Goodness, so yeah, looking forward to this. So um, if we take a look at the slides, we've got a bit of a um, reminder uh, there of what we're talking about. And on its on the surface, cash accounting is really simple. So it's going to be as simple as cash in minus cash out. Ta-da! We're done. But as we've got at the bottom here, although some adjustments may be required and that's the bit that could catch us out so in theory a business very much relying on its bank feeds may get a good um, amount of progress towards cash accounting results but as always the need to look at what is coming through the bank transactions what is coming through as cash transactions we do still need to analyze that because of course we've still got the principle that we're only going to be deducting expenditure that's incurred wholly and exclusively for the purposes of the trade. And we absolutely know that with clients, um, the concept of a business bank account and just using that for business transactions, not always the case. And also there could be things like drawings that are going to be showing as cash flowing out of the business, but that wouldn't be a deductible expense. So that is the position at its simplest. If we jump to slide four, we'll start having a look at some of these adjustments that we make if we are cash accounting. So capital expenditure, that's a big difference than when we are accounting using gap or accruals accounting. Of course, where we are accruals accounting, we're very used to holding capital expenditure on the balance sheet and then operating a plant and machinery capital allowances pool to get tax relief on eligible capital costs. <clears throat> Much simpler than that under cash accounting. In the main, if the business is buying eligible capital items, and that broadly means assets that would qualify for plant and machinery allowances, they're just going to flow through as cash expenditure. So much simpler. Now, the exception to that rule is cars, and we'll touch on that a little later. So very easy where capital expenditure is concerned. Now, if, again, like I've mentioned before, we can't have drawings going through as cash expenditure, <clears throat> if there is private use of an asset, we need to adjust for that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Andy, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go, I'll, I'll give you my, my assessment. <clears throat> yeah, well, if you'd like to talk about capital disposals yeah. on slide five. I've got it, I've yeah, got it, good, I'm on. Right. Um, thank you for your help there, it was invaluable. <laughs> Google. Uh, don't ask him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, capital disposals, the flip of what we've just seen for capital acquisitions. So if we're a cash accounting business, when we sell an asset where we've previously had a cash deduction for the cost of it or the equivalent on transaction, those disposal proceeds, other than for a car in most cases, are simply going to come through as effectively extra revenue, extra income. So we deduct at the time of spend and then we tax if we sell that asset for proceeds in the future. And again, there would be adjustments for any private use at that point. There is a bit of a funny in cash accounting where we do need to monitor private use of an asset over the life of that asset. So we might, for example, buy a van for £10,000 and we say it's 90% business use. So we'd have a £9,000 cash accounting deduction on day one then we might keep that van for a number of years. If in year three, that private use proportion increases from 10% to say 30%, we need to make a cash adjustment at that point for the extra private use, not based on the original cost, but based on the market value of the van at that time. Which throws you right out. Well, yes. 
So, wow, right. So what about, what are we going to do um, um, from 24, 25? What are the changes? What are we bringing in? Sure. Um, so let me just, before we do that, let me just, I did promise to come back to cars. So let me just mention with cars a bit different. I just used an example of a van where we're doing cash out and cash in. Pretty simple, adjusting for private use, perhaps not so simple. Cars, we're not going to do cash in and cash out ever with cash accounting. We will do one of these two options. So we will either use the standard mileage allowances for business miles, which we might be doing under gap accounting anyway. So 45p a mile for the first 10,000 business miles uh, and then 25p a mile thereafter. Or we can claim capital allowances. So again, just as the position is for gap accounting. So those are the two options when looking at cars and cash accounting, but either way, we're not going to follow the spend on the car or the disposal proceeds on the car. Okay? Got that. Right. So you wanted to hear about... Well, this cha they've changed it. So yeah. we, we, there were some announcements made, Mr Hunt. Yes. Did, um, they, well, they, they keep us on our toes, don't they? So this is going back to the autumn statement last year. A bit of a surprise announcement, for me anyway, and we'll talk about why that may be a little later, because I know we've got MTD on the agenda. We for, do indeed. Uh, towards the end of, of course. This, end of this session. So we'll come back to the why, but the surprise announcement was we've currently got a position where a business can choose to use cash accounting if they are within size thresholds. But the default position is that they will be using gap accounting for the purposes of their uh, self-employed income. What is going to be different from 2425 is that emphasis of choice changes. So if we can take a look, if it's possible, at slide eight, but if not, we'll just talk through it. Um, the default position is going to be fantastic. Is going, well, the default position perhaps won't be fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just very pleased to see my slides. Um, cash accounting is becoming the default. And as we can see here, the entry and exit thresholds that have applied previously, they go. So for most, I will show you some exclusions in a moment, but for most of our unincorporated businesses, so certainly including the sole traders, the partnerships, regardless of their size of turnover, regardless of their commercial position, regardless of their year end, they will default to the cash basis of accounting for tax purposes from 24-25. Now, I know Sarah's going to pick up on this later, but just in the same way that at the moment a business can choose to opt into the cash basis by putting a tick on the self-employed pages, we anticipate that going forward a business would choose to go into gap accounting or stay in gap accounting uh, with a similar mechanism. So the default position has changed. The turnover thresholds have gone from 6th of April 2024. And <clears throat> the two main things that put businesses off cash accounting, in my view, have been removed. So going back to the poll we had at the start, what was it, Andy, that 16%? Well, 16% claiming to be doing a lot of cash accounting clients. Yeah, so I wonder if that actually ties into those points I was coming to. So what will often put businesses off, in my experience, has been they've been limited with interest tax relief of up to £500 interest a year. So for any business that's been spending more than that on interest, they'd be giving up tax relief. And <clears throat> the loss relief rules are currently and have been more restrictive with cash accounting. So those two key barriers have just been removed. Now, coming back to the 16%, I wonder if, and if anybody wants to contribute in chat, by all means do, I wonder if those agents are dealing with businesses that perhaps haven't got particularly high interest costs or haven't been generating losses that they need to relieve in the most effective way. Yeah, so, yeah, I'd be interested to know if you put in, in um, I mean, Phil Hendy has pointed out, the question did say unincorporated clients, which may be what is skewing things. Mm -hmm. But if you have got a lot of clients that um, are on the cash basis, be particularly interesting to know, did they put themselves onto the cash basis before you picked them up? Or did you advise them to? Or how did that happen? Just be interested to hear uh, your, your experiences in, in the chat. Definitely. So I think it's interesting because we, uh, this wasn't very heavily picked up actually at the time in the coverage when the autumn statement yep. came out. There were some 
other things in there that did. Um, but cash accounting didn't really get, get a lot of coverage. And a lot of people I speak to kind of give me the cash accounting no not, yeah, not, yeah. Not, not really interested but then well it's coming but um you i think there's some interesting kind of attitudes towards cash <clears throat> accounting yeah. aren't there so i i think that's fair and i also think it will shift as we go through the the coming months and years as well so it's really really interesting i think to be talking about this early on in the journey and starting to explore where it will go and certainly those removals of the key disadvantages of the interest restriction and the loss restriction yeah it does it does open the playing field just to pick up on that comment just to be clear these changes are just for unincorporated businesses so if we're dealing with a company oh the hearts today it's all about the gap <laughs> all about the gap we're not getting rid of accruals accounting for companies but for the unincorporated and if we can take a peek at <clears throat> slide nine please there are also a list of other ineligible businesses that are not allowed to go to cash accounting and therefore won't default on to it. So as well as the companies, uh, we won't be going to cash accounting for LLPs, Lloyd's underwriters, or for those of you with an agricultural uh, flair, uh, if you've got uh, farming businesses using the herd basis election or averaging profits, they will not go to the cash accounting uh, basis either. Now I had a question on this earlier in the week actually about farmers and averaging profits and <clears throat> the question was well what if they make an averaging election in 23-24 would that prevent them from opting into or staying going to the default cash basis in 24-25 and the answer to that is no. So those elections for herd basis or profit averaging it's we cannot do those in a tax year or make those elections while we are cash accounting. So it's a bit odd with the cash accounting becoming the default, but if we allow that default cash accounting to happen, we will be prohibited from making those herd and averaging elections. So Sarah Howard um, uh, has pointed out that uh, new clients have been advised to go um, onto the cash due to the changes coming in. So that's Sarah, I presume that's you um, uh, encouraging them to do so. And Vicky, uh, hi Vicky. Um, <laughs> Love Vicky. Uh, a lot of our sole traders are smaller clients, so uh, <laughs> under the cash accounting threshold, um, also don't have interest costs. We've advised a lot of them to go to cash accounting, so they only pay on, on amounts received. So I guess that, that's fairly standard. Yeah, and it, it actually leads us really nicely into some of the bits we had coming up um, now. Andy, the pros and cons? You want to do the pros, pros and, and the cons? Let's do it because Vicky's point there yeah. is one of the pros. It can be really, really helpful from a cash flow perspective for businesses to only start paying tax on their income when they've actually received it. So, of course, we often, when we're doing business advisory, we're talking about um, issues like managing debtor days. All of that disappears. So with cash accounting, until you've received the funds, you're not going to pay tax on them. Equally, you're going to be getting automatic bad debt relief. You, you know, if, if the customer doesn't pay, you're not. That's no. right. Yeah, good point. You haven't you haven't got that that process. So uh, absolutely, that can make it a lot simpler for some. But of course, that simplification it works the other way as well. You're not going to get relief for your expenses until you've pay, paid for that expense item or asset, as it may be. So it does depend business to business on how their cash flow generally works, how long it takes them to get money in, how long they generally wait before paying their, their suppliers. And I think it's also worth noting that with all of this, over the life of the business, total profits are going to come out in the wash. But of course, we're going into a really interesting couple of years expecting an election. I think we probably will see some changes in tax rates over over yeah. the coming years. So what profits were as advisors, let's say allowing to be recognised and when? I think we've got some scope for some really interesting discussions, some really interesting planning. So on the pro side, yeah, it's really we're looking at the fact that you're going to be able to get access to deductions immediately. Yeah. That's the, the main thing. And sim simplification, I think, back yeah. to this bank feed, that if you've got the technology plugged in, and again, I know Sarah will enlighten us on software in a mo. But when we've got our ducks in a row and we've got the bank transactions flowing through, cash accounting could be really, really quite simple if we can get that non-deductible expenditure out um, before filing. 
Well, Ma Mazar says um, expenses prepaid, uh, rates or insurance under uh, cash accounting can be written off in the year of payment. Correct. Uh, which is quite an interesting one. So um, yep. anyone else got any any good um, uh, pros for cash accounting? Throw them in now. We'll, we'll flag those up. And, and Vicky, no, you don't get a hoodie. Oh. Not yet. <laughs> you say me. We're, 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 no, no, no. You've got to... You've got to oh. otherwise Sharon, we've we'll... had um, an interesting question from Lawrence asking yep. about adopting cash accounting, but they're not using cash accounting for VAT. So he's saying, does this mean that the uh, records won't, they'll be misaligned? <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a really, really good point, Lawrence, because at the moment, at the moment, we've seen no proposed changes to legislation in terms of, well, cash accounting for landlords, I was going to mention later anyway, or cash accounting for VAT. So absolutely, those, those two schemes both still have the turnover thresholds. So if we have a business that is uh, needing to do accruals accounting for VAT purposes, yeah, you're going to end up with separate sets of records for that that purpose. Yeah. Okay. So on the downside, though, there there's some 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 negativity, isn't there? Yeah. Well, yes. I think there are some problems with this as a as a default plan, and and I think that comes back to the value that we're providing to clients generally. For me, this is at the core of it. That gap accounts just give us more information. They enable us to advise the client on where they've been and where they're going. And a simple cash P&L of what's come in, what's come out, that doesn't necessarily give a ideal reflection of business performance. Now, again, I don't want to be one size fits all here. For some trades, it might be good enough. But for others, that adjustment for the stock, the debtors, the creditors, the prepayments, as we've already had mentioned, the capital allowances, it it does make a difference and enable us to help guide that business towards growth and success in the future. And increasingly, we're seeing emphasis on accountants doing more for business advisory and helping businesses to identify their goals and then achieve their goals. And that's so much more than preparing a simple P&L once a year. Yeah. So you think, I mean, it'd be very difficult to kind of provide a great deal of forward advice based on, on a cash. I for more accounts? complex businesses, I, I do I do think so. And of course, we were talking about it um, here before we press go. There's going to be lenders out there that simply require gap accounts. Yeah. So <clears throat> coming back to this VAT cash accounting point, there might be a middle ground. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what software options we get as this develops. Because will we have scenarios where we are producing gap accounts for finance, for business advisory, for VAT reasons, but for income tax, we're able to toggle and use simpler cash accounting if we can get cash flow advantages from doing so. Now, those cash flow advantages are likely to be short term for the reasons that we've already talked about, that all of this is going to come out in the wash. But there could be some analysis we do with clients to weigh up these pros and cons. Because what about there, there was a comment before about uh, depreciation, for example? Yeah. That's what gone now? Yeah, or? so you won't get tax relief for depreciation because it's not a cash outflow. So when we're buying the asset, we're getting immediate relief. Depreciation, no, it's gone. So you may not be seeing an accurate value of the no, assets? In the no, business. if you buy an asset that's going to enable you to generate revenue for five years, the cost of that asset is all going to be shown in year one. Yeah. And Sharon, Alan's asked an interesting mm. question about acquisition of a, a fixed asset that's on finance. Yeah. How would you deal with that? Yeah, these <laughs> ones are, um, they're getting fun. So it depends on what. So I've had a few questions around this previously as well. So if it's something like a higher purchase agreement where the asset and the finance are very much interlinked, we're just going to follow the cash. So as those repayments are made, that's when we're going to be claiming relief on the cash basis for those deductions. But somebody said to me the other day, well, what if it isn't a higher purchase or a finance lease type arrangement? What if the business owner goes and gets a bank loan? So I would say full stop at that point. And then they go and buy an asset with that funding and then they repay the bank loan. Well, in my mind, that is an asset purchase and we claim 100% relief for the asset at the time of purchase. And then we've got a separate balance sheet funding arrangement whereby we have got the ongoing loan repayments, which in the main are not going to be deductible, but of course those interest elements in there, they will be deductible in the cash P&L. 
Okay. Interesting. That makes sense. We've also had a, sorry. No, no, no sorry. <laughs> Another question, there's lots of questions. <laughs> questions um, about LLPs and okay. their status, yeah. So LLPs are not allowed to go into cash accounting. So very much like companies, we are all about the gap. So we'll continue to do gap accounts for the LLPs and we will then continue to do the partnership returns um, as we have been doing previously. So no cash accounting for those. Okay, so the pros and the cons uh, of cash accounting. Um, so this is the, 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 I think the big thorny issue here is, okay, you've got, you've got a client, you've made the decision, you're gonna, they're, they're gonna move. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to talk about what discussions that yep. you know you want to have with them. But what, let's look at the transitional rules first. So yeah. how, how do you go about doing this? How, how are we being set up? Sure. Uh, so transitional rules operate as they would today if we had a client that chooses to go on to cash accounting. We just have to be very aware that if we do nothing, by doing nothing, unless it's an ineligible business like an LLP, if we do nothing, that client is going to move to cash accounting and these transitional rules will therefore be triggered. So this is what's going to happen unless in 24-25 we elect into gap accounting. So if we could take a look at slide 14, it sets out the, the process we need to go through and effectively we can think about it as we need to unpick a balance sheet. So what we're going to do is have a look at the balance sheet for the last period that has been prepared under gap accounts and look at all of the types of things that were appeared on the balance sheet and therefore had a P&L impact that wouldn't have happened under cash accounting. So we're going to identify our debtors, our prepayments, our creditors, our accruals, our deferred income, our stocks. We're also going to look at our capital allowance pools and look if there's any balance remaining in the main rate pool or the special rate pool because these are assets we've acquired but we haven't yet had relief. And then what we'll need to do is calculate an amount of adjusted income or adjusted expenditure that will effectively reposition the client as if they had been preparing those prior accounts on a cash basis. So on the next slide, we have an example, because I always think with this, if we put some maths in, it makes it, well, just puts it back in our comfort zone. So. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> I'm very comfortable with the numbers. Uh, so we have Simon, and this is Simon's balance sheet to 5th of April, 2024. So we've got a range of uh, items there. We've got some assets, we've got some liabilities. So we do need to identify which assets and which are liabilities. Um, and then if we have a look at what happens for the calculation on the next slide, what we can see is we are taking those assets and we are showing those as negative numbers because these are items where we haven't yet had tax relief. So if we have purchased stock but carried it forward in closing stock, that expenditure hadn't yet been deducted. So we're effectively going to give that deduction for last year's closing stock in the current year. So that's a deduction, that's a negative amount. Whereas if we think about trade creditors, they were amounts that we had owed to our suppliers at the previous year end. We hadn't paid them at the previous year end, but we had claimed relief. So that goes in the opposite way. If we didn't make this adjustment, when we pay that creditor for £950 in the cash accounting year, we'd claim relief, but we already had relief last year. That would be double counting. So all of those liability figures will come into our working as a positive because we are clawing back tax relief that we've already had. So we list all those together to get a total. If that total is positive, as it is in this case, we have got adjustment income. If that total is negative, we have got adjustment expenditure. And what we're going to do with our adjustment income or adjustment expenditure is bring that into account in the first period of cash accounting as if it's an amount of income or an amount of expenditure that arose on the last day of that accounting period. Does that make any sort of sense? I can see everyone out there cannot wait to get stuck oh. into this. There's so, everyone's absolutely excited now just yeah. to start 
transitioning clients well, from one way to the why other. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> it's uh, unpacking a balance sheet. What's what's not to love? Uh, that example didn't have um, capital allowances in, but if Simon had a main rate pool, let's say with a thousand pounds, well, that's a bad example because we'd use uh, our small pools allowances, wouldn't we? So let's say he's got a main rate pool with two thousand pounds sitting on it, hasn't had tax relief for it. That would be a negative part of our adjustment expenditure in that transitional working. Now, if you don't mind, Andy, I think I should also mention how the transitional work rules work if we go the other way around. I think you might as well. I think you should. <laughs> because we're all enjoying it. We want to put a balance sheet back together. Let you know how to have well, fun. That's yeah. what I like about you, Sharon. <laughs> There's no party like a cash accounting party. <laughs> um, so um, we might have clients that go into cash accounting knowingly or unknowingly. I wonder if in a few years um, you'll pick up clients that have defaulted into cash accounting and didn't know what that meant for them. And we want to unpick that. We want to leave the cash basis. If we could have a look at the slides again, slide 17 for this one, it's effectively a reverse of what we've just done. So under cash accounting, we may have invoiced our customers, but not received the revenue in our cash accounting year end. So we've not brought that income into account. If we're going to go back into gap accounting, we're going to need to bring that in as income as part of our adjustment because it wouldn't come in under gap accounting. We don't recognise when income is received. We recognise when income is generated. So the flip of what we've just seen. But what is a bit odd but worth flagging at this point is there's an extra rule when somebody is leaving the cash basis. Now, if, as Simon did in our previous example, if on joining the cash basis, we've got net adjustment income, it comes in in one tranche. But if we're leaving the cash basis, there's an extra piece of legislation that says if we've got adjustment income on leaving, we can, well, it will be spread over six years. And just like we're seeing with basis periods, we can elect to accelerate that spread income if we so wish. And if you can bear with my balance sheet and tax fund for just a little bit longer. One more, Go on. one more. Uh, if we could just have a look at slide 18, because there's another nuance with this adjustment, uh, expenditure and income. Uh, and that's what happens with the class for Nick. So, so far we've been talking about income tax. And on an ongoing basis, the class for Nick position will be exactly the same. So if we're using cash accounting and we're calculating profits under cash accounting, they're going to be assessed a class four uh, using the normal thresholds, just, just as normal. So the income tax and class four operate as usual. But with this adjustment income or expenditure that we're bringing in on the last day of the accounting period under the new basis, it's really important to note that the net adjustment income doesn't give rise to class four, whether that's coming in in one lump or whether we're spreading it over up to six years. So that is not class four relevant income. Whereas if it is adjustment expenditure, that is deductible for class four. So when we're helping clients, when we're doing this business advisory and we're predicting future tax liabilities, tax payment dates, if we're looking at this move to cash accounting as an option for that client, it is just worth being aware that if they've got adjustment income as a result of that balance sheet unpicking that we've been enjoying, that adjustment income comes in on the last day does give rise to income tax, but it won't give rise to class four, Nick. So essentially the balance sheet is, is going. Uh, yes, and certainly is... for the for the cash accounting um, tax declaration. We might, like we said earlier, try to do some sort of best of both and keep it for advisory purposes maybe, or management accounting, whatever we're doing with that client. Um, but yeah. I'm detecting, and this is just, mm. I'm getting the, the waves from Ooh. from the chat and from from the questions that there's not a lot of of love right here this is just it's just something i'm getting from the people saying well, things like why the hell are we doing this yeah. this is awful um yeah. so what happens though i mean if is it completely le legitimate that you can just have a conversation with all of your customers i think we're going to touch on this yeah. later but have a conversation with all your customers and just say, right, we're ignoring this. We're go I'm going to opt everyone back into accruals and carry on merrily. No, I don't think you can do that. 
because it's the business owner's decision. So if we just play that story out for even one of the clients, if we don't have a conversation with them and we tick that box as their advisor, absolutely, we're sending them that return for approval, hopefully, and they're going, yes, I've reviewed it thoroughly and I'm convinced what you've done is correct. Yeah, yeah. please, where do I sign? Yeah. Let's say we've done that. And then they become aware six, 12, 18 months later that if that box hadn't been ticked, if cash accounting based results had been entered on the self-employed pages, they'd have paid £2,000 less tax and they'd have paid less payments on account in the following period. And we didn't talk to them and give them that option and explain why we may or may not want to tick the box. I think that could cause a reputational issue at best, perhaps. We could even be looking at professional indemnity insurance claims. We've got to get client approval for what we're doing. Which means a conversation. I think so. A long, probable conversation. Well, yeah, we need to cover it in some way. I don't know. We need to come back to reality. And, you know, we had quite a mix in that poll at the start, didn't we, of some people using it. And for those clients where it is suitable, you know, I, I think we've just got to categorise the clients a bit, segregate them into perhaps likelihood of cash accounting being suitable, but then have a conversation with each of those categories. So for the ones that were saying they're really not going to find cash accounting useful, they've got masses of stock, debtors, creditors, it's going to make their results too variable each year if we're just on cash. We could have a relatively easy conversation about that, just in even a you know year end meeting to show that cash accounting would be variable. It won't, we don't believe it'll work for your business because of X, Y, and Z. Are you comfortable with us continuing on this basis? They say, yes, I think that sounds like a good plan. We document that conversation. And I don't think we'd need to get into producing two sets of accounts, in my view. And l okay. With, with those clients where it's clearer. Yeah. Whereas you've got 16% of our viewers today are saying, I'm already doing it where we've got clients like these advisors have, where it's a no-brainer for them, it's simpler, and we do need to talk about MTD in a moment. Oh, I can't, I know, I'm holding that off, because that, that's the... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> do do you think, that is there any um, fear or possibility that the inquiries might be raised more if you don't do the cash basis as a... I, I don't know whether that could... As in HMRC inquiries? HMRC inquiries, yeah. Um, I haven't had that question before, so good question. Oh, we haven't practised this one, so excellent, no, Andy, no, yeah, yep. good. Um, my, my immediate reaction is no. I, I don't think it should trigger inquiries. I think we're seeing other things the revenue are doing at the moment, like they're very interested in dividends that are not being declared or perhaps income from online platforms that are not being declared. I think they'd use intelligence from third parties and look at underdeclared income as a driver. But what could then happen when the revenue are looking at a return or accounts for other reasons, if we've blindly gone into this because we haven't realised there's a distinction here. So we've produced gap accounts, we've declared gap accounts, but we haven't ticked the box to opt into gap accounts. So we've told the revenue it's cash accounting and we've declared a P&L that's based on, on gap, gap, then we've got an incorrect return. Right, yeah. And I would suggest we've got a return where we're not going to be able to say that reasonable care has been taken in that return, so we'd be into penalties for careless. So that could raise an issue. We, we mm. do, in fact, have um, Paul Rigney yep. um, coming into the studio in uh, a few months' time, after, after April, um, and we'll certainly ask him oh, okay. that question to see Great. whether he, he um, uh, around tax investigations, uh, HMRC investigations. Okay. Um, so we have got, um, yes, and, and the whole hour is about self-employed, yes. Uh, notice that in the, in the chat, because that is what uh, the cash accounting basis is doing. So um, there's so many questions, and, and I'm, we, we need to employ more people on the, uh, on the chat deck. Uh, anything that particularly that you want to throw out before we get into the world of MTD and basis period reform? Yes, there were a couple of other interesting ones. Um, purchases of land and property, because, of course, SBAs on commercial property yeah, be available. If you, if you want to claim SBAs, you'll need to stay on gap accounting. So that won't be a feature under cash accounting. So the only assets we're going to get the cash deduction for 
are those that would qualify for plant machinery capital allowances. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, though I would just say on that, I find it quite rare to see structures and buildings allowances and almost if they are being claimed, it's again, I find often, so I don't want to make sweeping statements, but it's often a case it's happened through a lack of thinking, we've defaulted into it rather than thought about it. So I remember last year I saw um, a claim for SBAs, it was something like 42 pounds. I'm like, what are you doing? It's not worth it for the amount of admin that is involved. So yeah, I I'd, I'd just encourage you to really think through whether you do want to claim SBAs if you have thought about uh, all the requirements that have to be met to make those claims and the fact it will all come out in the wash when the asset is sold later down the line. Anyway, for some business is great, but I find in the main not okay. but a good thing to talk about. Thank you. And just one more. I think um, Neville asks, does the, mm. the mismatch on class four yep. create an opportunity to flip in and out of cash and accruals and uh, uh, have an NIC yeah, There's another question here, um, just saying, uh, what is the, the um, uh, is there anything to stop businesses swapping between, back and forth between them generally? Uh, okay, um, so under the legislation, no, there is nothing to stop. So that election to use gap accounting as it will be is made on an annual basis. So we could make it one year, not the next, make it one year, not the next. From HMRC's perspective and a legislative perspective, the reason we probably wouldn't do that is just cost. Um, again, back to over the life of the business, we're going to be declaring effectively the same amount of profits. Tax rates might change over that period. But every time we swap from one basis to another, we're calculating and declaring adjustment income. And so to your point, Sarah, um, yes, there is, I guess, scope to aim to be generating adjustment income over and over and not paying class four on that. Whether the figures would support that, I'm thinking if you're in and out, would it? Mm. You know, I suppose you would end up with adjustment expenditure contouring adjustment income. I'd be wary of it, I think, from an ethical perspective and just general tax avoidance rules that say if we're doing something with the purpose of obtaining a tax advantage, it's it's challengeable. And it sounds like hard work, doesn't it, as well? I, think <laughs> we, I do think we <laughs> we're looking at what we're having to do. Dots, yeah. And these are often going to be relatively small businesses. So I think we really have to consider the commercials, consider the risk and, and go from there. But... At the moment, there's not any sort of anti forestalling legislation or anything to stop that. OK. Good comment by uh, Barry here, that says, uh, which I think he's referring to when we were we were talking about um, the potential liability that you might have from people who are submitting accruals and not being clear whether it's cash or accruals yep. and covering by letters of engagement. Yep. So are letters of engagement going to, or should they perhaps change? To oh, say, that is a... That is a great question and I'm now trying to just picture a uh, template if any of you watching can have a look at your template engagement letters and let me know so when you engage to do accounts and self-employed tax it might actually say you're going to produce accounts under UK gap or cash it wouldn't it wouldn't no I don't think it would avoid the issue we talked about Andy of not having the conversation because of course if the legislation changes after your engagement letter is signed, the fact the client signed an engagement letter previously, even if it does say gap accounting, if we now don't have a conversation when they're meant to be defaulting to cash, even if we believe that's better for the business, I just think ethically we've got to outline why we think it's better, get the client's agreement and then move on on that basis. If we rely on the engagement letter, I think they could still argue they weren't consulted and the rules changed after they signed it. Okay. This is, this is why I love the TaxCap TV oh. audience. They are full of yeah. information. <laughs> so, right, we're now going to blow everyone's brain because we're going to talk about MTD and basis period reform oh. and how that intersects yeah. with cash, uh, the cash basis. Hold on to your hats, yeah, everybody. Well, the, the MTD one, I think, is actually quite simple. It's the basis period one that we may just have to wave a white flag on for now, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so MTD, I think, is one of the pros, effectively, of moving to cash accounting. And um, we're not due to be going to making tax digital until April 2026. And I'm sure the chat is about to uh, get quite um, busy with comments around whether that will happen, because it's fair to say there's been a bit of wolf crying in this regard already, hasn't there? I'm saying nothing. Um, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Um, and we may well have a change in government be 
between now and April 2026. I think we'll have a lot of budgets and fiscal events between now and April 2026 and vote pleasing measures. So whether anything will change, I don't know. Um, but that said, I genuinely don't think at the moment there are plans to change the April 26 start date. What we know from April 26 is that um, self-employed businesses, sole traders and landlords with income of more than 50,000 will be mandated into making tax digital, which of course means not only digital record keeping, but quarterly reporting. And it's the quarterly reporting that is creating most friction. Now, what we saw, well, what we've seen previously is what well, changes in the approach to those, what those quarterly reports will look like. And it had already been made clear that even if a business was gap accounting, accruals accounting, it could do its quarterly submissions on a cash basis. So I'm now talking self-employed sole traders, not landlords, we'll put them separate for now. So a sole trader could do quarterly cash accounting and then do a year-end MTD adjustment for all that good stuff we talked about earlier, the debtors, the creditors, the accruals, the prepayments, the capital allowances and so on. Then we've just had in the autumn statement some more intended simplifications for the MTD quarterly reporting, including making it cumulative so any errors are effectively corrected as we go. We're not having to go back and refile anything. What's also been very clear over the last couple of weeks, even if we go back to HMRC's agent update from January, is the revenue are re establishing or trying to re-establish agent interest in getting their clients into what used to be called the pilot it's now being called the, testing the, the yes the testing phase the testing phase of mtd now again let us know in the chat what your current interest in testing is but yeah i've got i've got my own view um, so two years ahead of time if an agent has got a client on suitable software they can sign them up to mtd testing and move them to quarterly submissions starting the first quarter after 6th of April 24. Now, if we start thinking about the sole traders with turnover of more than 50,000, they could start quarterly reporting on a cash basis. One of the features of MTD is that every time a business submits a quarterly submission, they will get an income tax estimate back from HMRC. And something we've been saying since this idea was first mooted years ago now, was it 2015, 2017? Um, those tax estimates were always going to be almost misleading for a business that would have a lot of year end adjustments. That quarter isn't necessarily representative of what the business performance as a whole is going to look like. But if that business chooses to do cash accounting for the annual income tax assessment as well, suddenly those quarters start to make a bit more sense. Now, of course, the transaction spread over the year might still mean that the quarterly estimates are not so helpful, but I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing defaulting to cash basis happening at the same time as we're starting to see those sole traders coming into MTD, albeit on a voluntary basis. It does seem, uh, yeah, co coincidental. Yeah, I'm going to say, open Let's the door, open word. the door to choice. Yeah, okay. So um, there's there's so many more questions coming in. Um, we'll have to. I think we should get to them at the end because um, otherwise we're going to be bouncing Thank up. You. There's some really interesting you stuff. Are, yeah. Thank you for your comments, everybody. No, no. So uh, MTD, um, it doesn't. Yeah, we it should, shouldn't make too much of a difference. But no, I think. I think it makes each of them easier. So MTD makes cash accounting easier, cash accounting makes MTD easier, but it's still, cash accounting will still not be right for every sole trader. And do remember that the smaller sole traders and the partnerships, they're not coming into MTD for even from April 2026. Date TBC. Date TBC. So well, let's move to basis period. Yeah. This, this is really simple, right? This is oh, really straightforward. Well, wow. I was then going to say, my <laughs> phrase was, this is a bit of a mucky one. <laughs> uh, and it's an emerging issue. I fear I know the answer to it. The answer to it isn't great. Um, it's something that we've raised with the ICAW, who have in turn raised with HMRC. And it is thinking about basis period reform, which we've got starting in 20... Well, we've got happening now, the transition happening. And then from April 24 
as we know, we're using a tax year basis for declaring profits. For any business already on 31st of March or 5th of April, basis period reform isn't creating an issue. They were already declaring their results on an equivalent tax year basis. For all of our unincorporated clients that are preparing accounts to a period other than 31st of March or 5th of April, their default position will be they'll be chopping up their tax adjusted profits of let's say their December year end and taking nine months from one, three months for another, sewing them together to make a tax year. Okay, so that is the default for a business with a December year end. They of course can choose, but they're not required to change their year end to 31st of March or 5th of April. Now I won't get too deep into basis periods today, but what I wanted to talk about was that business that doesn't want to change year end because 5th of April doesn't commercially work for them. They're gonna stick with their 31st of December year end and deal with this basis period change. So doing tax adjusted profits for each December year end, taking nine months of one, three months of the other, and making a tax year basis of submission. How is that going to work given the cash accounting election, well, the gap accounting election as we now call it, is made on a tax year basis? Now, when you get the slide pack, which I know Andy was keen to emphasise, you will, you will be getting you will the be slide getting. pack. You will be getting the slide pack. I won't try and talk about it now because I know we've got some good questions coming in as well. There is a worked example in there. But just to um, highlight the issue now, if we've got somebody with a December year end, as they go through basis period transition, assuming they're too big to use the cash accounting at the moment, their December, I think it's their December 2024 year end, will have to be done on the gap basis. Thereafter, if they want to change to cash, how is that going to work? Now, I said before, I fear I know the answer. And I fear the answer is we're going to bring in nine months of gap results and add to that three months of cash results. Who knows what will happen with the tick box because we've used a bit of both. And I said earlier that the adjustment income or the adjustment expenditure for the, the first year that we use the new basis comes in on the last day. Well, the last day of the accounting period is going to be in the next tax year. So it's quite mucky. So are you anticipating a 15 month year with both or a, a two, two truncated years with one basis each? Well, I, th I think the default position, how it's just going to come out in the wash if the client does nothing, so they default to cash accounting, is they will, they'll, be, they'll be declaring one year's worth of results on one self-employed page, but it will be made up of this nine month plus the three month period. One has been produced on gap. And I think the only way to do it is to say the other one's been produced on cash. Now, one of the, if a business actively wants to do this or wants to avoid that mess, they could produce two short periods, but it's, it's very unclear how it would work and how the transition would work as well. Because then there's the question of, well, would you then charge that client to produce two sets of... Yeah, it's we really need HMRC guidance that addresses the issue. that Because this could be a very, you know, just very regular client. Let's mm. say it's a December year end. How is that going to work? If they stick with a December year end, they're using two accounting periods in every tax year and we're electing whether or not to use GAP on a tax year basis. So... Yeah, it, it, this is, yeah, it's not edge case, is it? This is really mainstream yeah, stuff. I, so. I, we, need, we need their view, and then I think we can uh, look at the practicalities around it. Um, so like I say, at the moment, we're waiting for, well, either updated guidance or hopefully a response. Um, I believe the query has gone to the team within HMRC that are working on both cash accounting and basis periods. You'd hope they've played this scenario out. Um, and maybe there's an easy answer. 
Well, obviously, everyone in chat is is avidly defending MTD and Good, yeah. um, are, are fully behind it as a as a fantastic um, <laughs> uh, project. Yeah. So that, it's nice to see that, and it's I good. know you guys are like, a big big fans uh, <laughs> <laughs> out there. Um, look, we're running out of time pretty rapidly, and there's we we wanted to talk about yeah. because we do have um, Sarah. There was a, a a little announcement we've got about basis periods. Um, Yes, yeah, we've got um, coming in the spring release, um, we have a basis period calculator that is going to help you uh, make your adjustments, um, choose whether you do a long accounting period or, or two accounting periods, and it will help you with the overlap and the accelerated profits um, and carry forward any transitional profits as well. So be more on that to come. Um, OK, so how do we want to do this? We've got five minutes. Um, if everyone out there is happy to run over, we can push probably for another five or so minutes after to get as many questions as we can, because we still want, need to talk about, we, we've kind of talked about the, the, the conversation that you need to have with your clients. Yeah. Um, but very briefly, I mean, the impact on fees. I mean, uh, there's an expectation maybe that some firms are going to lose clients. Mm -hmm. Uh, over this, what what's your take on the impact to the to the accountants' business, to the practice itself? Yeah, well, I'm still hoping the accountants won't lose business as a result of this, because even if we've got a client where cash accounting is suitable for them, there is still that piece of dealing with cars, dealing with capital expenditure, dealing with the transition, and on an ongoing basis, dealing with expenditure that's not eligible for a cash deduction, and the big business advisory piece that we're so good at um, helping business owners with, it would be a real shame if cash accounting and MTD leads to a, I don't need a business advisor anymore. What they might not need anymore is somebody to calculate debtors, creditors, accruals. Um, but that, you know, so I think, again, it's all going to be part of the conversation and demonstrating value and the partnership we have with the clients, just perhaps in a different way. So would that suggest perhaps a shifting in the way fees are calculated away from I do a tax return to I provide a broader service mm. and that I mean that's obviously a big general trend to yeah I, mean, I think we see more and more accountants using monthly billing now anyway um not and not everyone does I'm sure not everyone in this in this session um does but yeah having it as an ongoing service is just going to be more and more mm. relevant in the future um, I think almost whatever happens, less emphasis on a year end, you know, once a year, done, goodbye. And more emphasis on the ongoing service, the ongoing relationship yeah. uh, between the clients and billing. It makes sense to me for that to follow suit. So I think monthly billing will remain key. And bear that in mind, next month we've got a, a, a webinar that's on a very different subject I'll talk about later, but we are going to be talking about that move to sort of subscription billing, yeah. which does play to this. And I think with MTD as well, it's got to be seen as an ongoing service rather than a sporadic thing. OK, so software. We've had a, quite a lot of mentions in software. Largely, this is going to be impacting your bookkeeping software. Mm -hmm. But what, what's your take? What, what's your... Well, I, won I wonder if Sarah would like to talk about that one I, I can I can no yeah. I can Sarah <laughs> yes Sarah. who's she um <laughs> so yes we're hoping we can assist we obviously don't know yet um the form changes that HMRC are proposing um and whether there'll be any specific boxes for the accruals to cash adjustments and the consequent um adjustment to cl um, class 4 NIC as well we're not aware that the current adjustment box um is subject to class 4 NIC so we would expect something to be coming there unless you're expected to make that manual profit um, decrease in the self-employment pages. Um, so obviously we'll need to consult with customers about the functionality they th think would be useful to them and how much has already been accounted for in their bookkeeping software. So subject to further analysis and the HMRC forms changes we'd We'd want to provide assistance, I think, with our, in our usual way with validation, check and finish regarding the cash or accruals basis to make sure you know that you've chosen one and not just opted for a default. Um, we'd like to assist with the transition adjustments that have to be made, particularly the tax specific ones um, like capital allowances. And yeah, have check and finish reminder for class four profit adjustment um, if there isn't something that's in the return itself. Thank you very much. So there will be, tax calc have got it. We we will we will be 
actively um, uh, accommodating for cash accounting as well with some, some additional uh, features. Uh, but you say m most of this will be dealt with with your, your bookkeeping software and that's relatively yeah. straightforward. You just elect, yeah, I'm going to just push yeah, that to uh, them. I, I don't author bookkeeping software, but yes, yeah, so I think in terms of record keeping, there potentially is a decision to make as we head towards 6th of April 2024, but I envisage that most business owners will carry on maintaining records the way they do now. Um, so Carol and the bookkeeping software, what would be lovely, I don't want to box any of the software companies that provide the bookkeeping software in, is if um, when the time comes to pull the results of a quarter or other period out, if it'd be possible to have some sort of toggle to sh say, show me the results on the cash basis, show me the results on the gap basis, that could really help with some of the I believe way. Zero does, oh. I, th I think Zero already does, but please someone correct me on that. Um, so yeah, so you've got to, to but really, but, you know, but take a look at what software you've got mm. and make sure that it's going to be able to can handle what you need. So, okay, um, Sarah, we've got a bit of time for a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll leave you. I know it may be half term for a lot of people, but the kids do need picking up. So. <laughs> oh, do they? <laughs> um, so what happens, this is an interesting one, about significant losses created if you're moving from one basis to the other. Will they still be carried forward as usual? So if the losses are arising um, after, six, well, if they're arising in the gap accounts, no problem. You've got all your normal loss relief options. And if they're arising in cash accounts in 24, 25 or onwards, you've also got all your normal options. So you've got sideways relief in the year, you've got carry back and you've got carry forward. Okay, thank you. All right. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to see if we've got any more. There were so many. I know. It's hard to, I can <laughs> we've probably keep missed up quite with. a few. Sorry. We do apologise. <laughs> well, look, let's. Um, uh, we, we've, we've gone over time. I, I never like to do that. Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, you guys are wonderful. It's, we couldn't do this mm. without you. Your input and your questions are so useful uh, and so insightful. I uh, hope that did give you some food for thought and, and potentially some, brought up some ideas that you hadn't considered uh, already. Um, so thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us and talking through the, the, the technology side. And of course, Sharon, um, you're, you're a legend. We love having you here. Thank you. I hope you'll be joining us again uh, later in the year. Uh, and we'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks time. It's the 2020 conference, the spring conference uh, in uh, Liverpool Street. And I think there are still tickets and you don't need to be a 2020 member to no, go. No, right? um, so no, we are still, um, we do still have some places on that conference for members and non-members. Uh, set to be a really good day. We're doing, I won't get the P's in the right order, but we're doing profits, practice, planet and people. And we will be there as well. well and Tax Cat ta ta yeah. will be there. Yeah, um, yeah so we, we, we'll, we'll see you there if you are coming along, which would be wonderful. Um, so, in the next instalment of Tax Cat TV, we will be um, at the 20th of March. Uh, we will be looking at a more strategic issue. We're going to be looking at the exit value and how you should be thinking about your firm from day one about the exit value and how that changes the emphasis that you put on the decisions that you're, you're making. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and on the 28th of February, two weeks today, we'll be back here for the first power hour of 2024, uh, in which we will be um, looking, we'll be joined by um, Calathea, uh, Lucy Brown from Calathea, who's going to be talking about how uh, you can uh, reduce the risk in your practice with the effective use of the software. So what do you put in that software to make yourself um, unnoticeable by the, uh, the inspectors? Um, I will be sharing a link in the chat uh, to that um, when I can find the chat. Um, and <laughs> if you are TaxCalc customers, we do salute you. Uh, but if you're not and you want to find out more about how TaxCalc can help you with its uh, award-winning tax accounts and practice management uh, software, uh, drop a line to uh, sales at taxcalc.com or just go to taxcalc.com and uh, you can find out all about the software that is available and will help you find the right bits. So once again, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, have a wonderful uh, Valentine's Day uh, to everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. You have been listening to the TaxCalc podcast of the TaxCalc webinar, The Cash Accounting Conundrum. 
It was presented by Andy North and Sarah Dudley with special guest Sharon Cook. The producers were John Davis and Tom Holmes. The original webinar was broadcast on the 14th of February 2024 and can be viewed at www.taxcout.com forward slash events. Please be aware that deadlines, rates and other technical details referenced may have changed since this date.